Welcome to the Firebelly Social Show. We're focused on talking to food and beverage brands that are on a mission to make the world better. Hey, 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 everyone. Duncan here with another episode of the Firebelly Social Show, where we chat with founders and leaders of mission-driven food and beverage brands. These are people that are making the world better, you guys. So we're so excited to be here. Uh, Arnell's here with me, our co-host. What's up, Arnell? Hello, Duncan, and thanks everyone for tuning in to this latest episode of the Fire Belly Social Show. We have a great show lined up for you today, talking with Vanessa, founder of Tilden Cocktails. This episode is brought to you by Fire Belly Marketing. At Fire Belly, we help mission-based food and beverage brands bring people closer through social media marketing. So if you're ready to use social media to create more community and excitement around your food and beverage brand, go to firebellymarketing.com to learn more. Thanks, Arnaud. I'm so excited to uh, welcome Vanessa Royal. Royal, Welcome, Vanessa, from Tilden Cocktails. Welcome to the show. Thank you both so much. Really excited to, to chat with you today. Vanessa, you, we, we have been doing a little bit of digging, and we saw that you have been an entrepreneur since a very young age and you were selling flowers door to door. (laughs) Really dug into the vault for that one. Um, Yeah, so when I was young, my mom um, encouraged my entrepreneurial ideas and we, she's a big gardener. So we uh, made a little door to door iris selling business. So I had my wagon and we had a big binder with physical photos of every iris and all its beauty. And we sort of went around the neighborhood. We crashed some farmer's markets, got kicked out. It was a very good early exposure to sales and rejection and success and all the fun things. So yeah, that's, I guess, where it all started. It didn't continue for long, but it was fun. (laughs) I mean, rejection at such an early age that you just had to move on. So that's awesome. Yeah. My mom's motto is always, if you don't ask, you don't get it. And she's a very much do it and apologize later type person, which, you know, there's there's moments. But um, I, I learned a lot of good lessons from that early, early entrepreneurial endeavor. Yeah, I love that. Real resilience about quite early. <laughs> How does it get started with Tilden to tell us that story? Yeah, I quit drinking in May of 2020. Um, I was about to go off to business school and entrepreneurship in general had been sort of floating in the back of my head. I was coming from a tech public relations career, was very open to new opportunities, new things. I was a big fan of Shark Tank. I was like, you know, the world's my oyster. Let's go off to business school, see what else is out there. And so this coincided with me quitting drinking and going off to uh, business school, which you may or may not know is quite a, a party hardy group of people, typically, you know, work hard, play hard. And I was very confident announcing to people I was meeting that I didn't drink. Um, but I did experience a lot of, you know, why are you drinking? Do you have a problem? Um, are you pregnant? Are you religious? What, like, why, why, why? And constantly being questioned. And it was just frustrating to me that as I was forging new relationships, with classmates and professors, my sobriety was often the thing people wanted to talk about most. And at a lot of these mixers and soirees and nice events, um, my beverage option was often a soda or a sparkling water that someone, you know, pulled out of the back of their fridge. And it just immediately branded me as other, you know, I was in the corner drinking at the kid table, it felt like often. So I was just kind of getting frustrated that I didn't have something great, that people weren't thinking ahead. Um, and this was also sort of in 2020. So during COVID where we were having smaller social events and, um, you know, opportunities to really network were sort of few and far between. So I felt a little bit left out during these occasions. Um, and my business school had a startup boot camp two week accelerator program. And I said, you know, I'll join some other existing team. And then this idea for a for a sophisticated non-alc cocktail um, came to mind one night after getting home from yet another party where I was drinking soda water, um, pulled together some Google slides that were very rough uh, and pitched on Zoom to classmates and anyone who potentially could be interested. I sent out a Slack message. I said, hey, I have this idea. If you want to join my team for this two-week boot camp, please let me know. I'm looking for folks 
you know, in finance and branding and things that I don't have experience with. So my now co-founder, Mariah, actually joined that Zoom chat. And she is a lifelong non-drinker, is a total foodie, mixology gal, hostess extraordinaire, very creative, um, passionate person. And she and I just immediately clicked and bonded over the shared frustration around um, not having a great adult beverage that just happened to not have alcohol. Um, So we, along with two other members of our team, Nicole and Carlton, worked on uh, the very, very, very early stages of Tilden for two weeks. We pitched some investors. We were all just so excited about what we were doing. And so after the end of the two weeks, we we kind of decided to keep going and then worked on it basically in between classes for the rest of business schools, squeezed a lot of lemons and limes, had a lot of dinner parties, testing concoctions and getting feedback from our friends. Um, and then we finally, uh, we graduated a year ago and then we finally launched this past February. Well, congratulations. I mean, what Thanks. what what a journey. And I loved um, one of the things um, I was reading was, um, which I wanted to dig in here because we're, we're all social people and um, maybe us especially. So um, <laughs> you talk about meaningful social experiences and how, I mean, I think I was reading between the lines is that your social experience maybe was compromised because of other people and the way they approach alcohol. And- <laughs> I don't know, maybe just say more about that. That's such an interesting uh, interesting way of, of seeing all this. Yeah, I think COVID for a lot of people was such an inflection point and a moment to reflect. So for me, prior to COVID, I'd been a big drinker. I was, you know, a big partier in college. After college, I was very social. And every event, day or night, was somehow focused on alcohol, whether it was a bar crawl, a birthday party, a networking event, alcohol was always a big component. And so when I quit during COVID, I didn't have to deal with that because we were all inside. We were, none of us were going out. And all of a sudden, when I went off to business school, I did for the first time in months have the opportunity to socialize. And it was during those moments where I went, oh no, this, my life revolves around social alcohol drinking um social drinking and i was the person who was like why aren't you drinking come on just you know i was the annoying person that you meet at the bar and this moment of awakening of oh god i get it now i understand why um it can be difficult for those who are drinking to like understand the other side of things um at the same time as i was introducing it was pretty great because I was introducing myself to completely new people who had no idea that I was a drinker before. And so it was sort of this moment to reintroduce myself and just have a clean slate. Um, But I was going to part, you know, announcing that I didn't drink or not announcing, but hey, you know, no, I don't drink. I'll have something else Um, being very upfront about it. And uh, as I did that, more and more classmates, friends came out of the woodwork like, oh, I'm allergic or I'm actually trying to cut back or I'm pregnant, don't tell anybody, you know. Um, And so I think these social occasions, it just kind of made me realize how ubiquitous alcohol is in every situation in a way that should have been very obvious to me before. But as a drinker, just you just assume there's always going to be alcohol and you don't really give it a second thought. And uh, quitting really opened my eyes to the fact that it exists everywhere and there weren't a lot of great options if you were a non-drinker or sober curious or you just wanted to take a night off there was just at least at the time very few things that that were available that's so true and i feel like you know a couple of things that you said that really connected with me one where you're talking about like being in college and having that seclusion to really think and just be more mindful when i felt like i went through that as well i realized that you know, social drinking, binge drinking, it was just the thing to do. And like you said, there's not really a lot of options. Um, and just being more mindful, having a, uh, just a mindset of being more mindful around drinking is so important. Another big thing that a lot of people ask uh, when it comes to non-alcoholic drinks and something that your brain is really well known for is that alcohol, uh, what would you call it? Like it, not an aftertaste, uh, but real true alcohol feel. So how did you get to that point? How hard was that to replicate? Because that's probably one of the most 
concerning things when people were like, am I going to try this or not? You know? So our big thing when we were working for that year and a half on, on product <laughs> development were I, I really wanted something that was ready to serve. So, you know, I like using some of the alcohol uh, spirit alternatives to make cocktails, but that's not something I necessarily want to do every night. So I wanted something that was really easy, whether you're at home or whether it's a bartender that they can just pour over ice and go. So our goal was bottle a fully formed non alcoholic cocktail. Um, the second thing was I really didn't want a ton of sugar. It felt like if I was quitting drinking, I certainly did not want a sugar headache the next day. So that was just number two. And then our two other things were we want that cocktail finish, which you just mentioned, um, which I can get into in a sec. And then the, the fourth thing was um, we wanted to stay away from adaptogens. So there are a ton of really great adaptogenic products, many of which I drink. Um, we felt like we wanted to create a product that was safe for anyone on medication, anyone pregnant or nursing. Um, and we just really wanted to lean into this idea that you don't have to you know, there's a lot of brands that are the buzz without the booze. And I think those serve a great purpose, but you don't have to have a buzz, period. And the point of going to these social events, you know, and really leaning into this is creating genuine connection. You don't have to have something to calm down or you don't have to have this to to be up or I don't want to be drinking five caffeinated cocktails at a bar like that. You know, there are products for that. And we've just felt like we wanted to really focus on flavors and, um, you know, sophistic sophisticated adult um, presentation on the kick on the kick side. So the the cocktail finish side of things, um, we were obsessed with getting a cocktail. So a beginning, middle, finish. A lot of um, virgin cocktails end up being soda water, some sugar, uh, juice, and that's kind of it. It's one note. It's delicious, but you chug it down. You're drinking it really fast. All your friends are still on their first sip of their cocktail or their glass of wine. And I'm ordering a second mocktail because I'm, you know, chugging through this thing. So we really wanted to focus on creating an adult cocktail that just didn't have alcohol. So we were obsessed with really nice aroma, huge complexity. Our drinks all have about 15 ingredients. They're all natural ingredients. We focused on mouthfeel. So we wanted a nice viscosity, a nice thickness to the drink so that it wasn't all water. It wasn't a juice. And then we wanted a kick. So um, our lace swimming cocktail, which is cucumber, basil, lychee, has a bit of Szechuan pepper and a tiny, tiny bit of cayenne to kind of slow you down, encourage you to be part of the moment, really welcome you into the cocktail conversation, you know, sip it and go, ooh, what's that? Like it, it evolves over time as a good cocktail does. Um, our tandem is a bit spicier. It's orange, tart, cherry, ginger. It has a little more cayenne. Um, it has a bit of smokiness. We use a really nice trio of Lapsang, Rooibos, and American Oak. So that one is, you know, very much like a cocktail. And we have gotten a lot of great feedback from folks who are like, this doesn't feel like a mocktail. It's not cupping anything. It doesn't feel like it's second rate. It doesn't feel like um, I'm missing out. And often people will drink it and go, there's no alcohol in this. And it's great because it doesn't taste like alcohol per se, but it tastes adult. And that was our goal was obviously kids can drink this if they wanted. That's not how we work, obviously. But we wanted something that felt like, no, I'm an adult who just doesn't drink or doesn't drink tonight. Yeah, I think the, I think I saw somewhere, I, I don't know if it was on your website or somewhere else, but uh, looks good, tastes good and makes you feel good. Yeah. Yeah. That was the goal. So I mean, we're not, you know, we don't push like we're not a diet thing you know it's not like lose weight with our cocktail that's not the goal but if you're not drinking i certainly don't want to be adding a ton of calories or sugar it doesn't you don't need to right it there are amazing all natural ingredients you can use and you don't have to add a lot of sugar and a lot of people don't want a lot of sugar and they don't necessarily always look at the nutrition label the great thing about non-alc is we are required by law to list nutrition facts whereas alcohol does not have to do that. So a lot of people don't realize how much sugar is in wine and sugar added to spirits. Um, we really viewed this legal requirement as a plus for us. We could list out all the ingredients. We could list out the nutrition facts. And so our goal is, you know, people taste it. They look at the bottle. They're like, wow. And then they turn it around. And they go, oh, and 
it's not bad for me. And that that's it, you know what's um I just have a couple of thoughts like I guess reactions uh, that you know it feels like even today I I know things are a lot better for people that are sober or sober curious in terms of their choices, but it still sometimes feels like maybe the early '90s did for vegetarians. Sure. You know, it's like, what do you mean? We got potatoes and beans. You know, it's like, well, I'll, I'll just put like a little plate together of potatoes and be- of some nonsense like that, right? And I think that's the other thing is that besides the reasons, all the reasons you talk about is like people do want a choice. It's like, I may say no, but I want to have the choice, right? It's right. like, don't be at a place where you're importing esoteric spirits from, you know, the very tip of South America, but I can't have a goddamn drink that doesn't have any sophistication to it. And and I don't mind paying for it. That's the other thing, right? Um, anyway, I just had to, I had to say that. Uh, I, I think that if I could just add like some, with the growth of non-alc in general, you know, the fastest growing segment in beverage is non-alc right now, which is amazing as a consumer. Um, a lot of bars and restaurants get it and they're looking for great options and they're coming up with their own stuff. And it's just really nice to see you when I go out to dinner or for drinks. Um, but people don't always know how to create that sophistication. So they'll kind of, you know, what's quick that we can offer that allows, you know, the DD or the pregnant woman or the sober guy to enjoy it. But they don't see it as like priority number one because they often don't get the margins they need. They're often, it's just often an afterthought. Um, that's another reason we made it ready to serve is when we go into bars or restaurants to sell, we go, your bartender can take two seconds. They pour this over ice, they garnish it, you get a great margin, and your customers are thrilled. Like, this is a no-brainer. This is free money for you. This is, like, yeah. great addition to that menu. We wanted to make it so easy for more people to have access to great drinks at restaurants. It's 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 phenomenal. Um, you mentioned that this is the fastest growing sector. We were talking to um, Jordan Haddad the other day. He's a uh, uh, entrepreneur in the tequila space, uh, tequila, my bad, mezcal space, and it's uh, it's it's another space where it's not you know it's not massively automated. But he the, the point he was talking about was people really want to know what goes into it, and there's no disclosure requirements. You said right for for a spirits brand, so they can put whatever the hell they want into it. I think there are some laws in the works to start requiring nutrition labeling. And I know there are some brands that have taken it upon themselves to put a nutrition label because if they have great ingredients and they don't have additives, it's totally a differentiator marketing opportunity for them. Um, but yeah, I didn't actually notice that until I started working on this until then. It was, um, you know, when I was personally designing the label myself, I went, we have to list everything? I've never noticed that before and then we really realized oh this is a great opportunity we list every ingredient we use we can talk about the fact that our drinks have one gram of sugar or less per serving like that's that's huge that's great i feel like they need yeah. cooking because it's like butter will make anything taste good and not a, not everyone wants to or can eat butter it's like okay it tastes amazing what's in it butter it's fine <laughs> like they, when you go out to eat you kind of just gotta you gotta just assume this is your night out. Is, you go for it. <laughs> Anything that has, it has butter, oil, X, Y, and Z, unless you're going to some really, really healthy joint, but it is what it is. Yeah, and kind of rolling right into that, we, so you talk about non-alcohol being the fastest growing beverage segment right now. Within the non-alcohol space, what kinds of trends and innovations are you seeing within the space that's kind of bubbling up? Yeah, we've... I mentioned adaptogens. So obviously adaptogens are very trendy right now. Um, you know, a lot of uh, hemp beverages, a lot of um, beverages with ashwagandha, different things, you know, whether they're calming or uh, caffeinated. Um, like I said, we don't include those. So we kind of fit in a different category. But um, I think RTDs, so ready to drink cans, are obviously super popular. Um, I'm, I'm listing all the things we don't do, which is kind of funny, but um, RTDs, uh, adaptogens, and then um, spirit alternatives, obviously, non-alp tequilas. Um, there's a new launch this week of, of a non-alp tequila. Um, non-alp mezcals are starting to be a thing. Um, 
yeah, all things we don't do, but our goal was, you know, shareable moments, something really easy um, and really focused on flavors, complexity and um, presentation. What is, uh, oh, go ahead, John, it looks like you have a question. Oh, I was going to talk, I was going to say, talk a little bit about um, your partnership and what you, it's Mariah, right? What you guys um, bring to the table and what that's been like, um, you know, growing this baby up. Yeah, we have a great dynamic. We are very different, which I think is a great thing. Um, when I previously worked back, um, my co-founders that I worked very closely with uh, described to me their relationship and they always talked about a Venn diagram. So as a founding team, you want to have enough in common overlap that you can get along and you can communicate well and you can align on vision. But you want to have a big swath of area that is quite different and oriented um, in various ways so that you can cover a lot of surface area. So when Mariah and I met, she was coming from a supply chain management background, which is a world I know zero about. Um, huge for beverage, huge for anything in CPG because operations are so key to what we do. Um, she also had a huge mixology background as someone who just had never drank, but came up with a lot of really great uh, drinks on her own. She's a total foodie. Um, I'm less of a food. I mean, I appreciate nice food, but I'm less of like a no seek out great food type person. Um, and then I was coming at it from background in tech, which, you know, it's kind of nice to have an outside perspective into this world and think of creative ways to do things differently. Um, and then public relations. So we had a lot of overlap on the the branding side. We very, very closely aligned on the vision where we wanted to take the company. Um, and so 99% of the time we agree. And the 1% of the 95, 95% of the time we agree. 5% that we don't. We have really great conversations because we're coming from such different perspectives, such different areas. Um, so she really manages marketing, um, operations side of the business. Um, we have a new employee who comes from the beverage, wine, beer, uh, Korean rice wine. So she has an interesting perspective having all and now uh, coming to work with us and with Mariah on ops. And then I own, you know, communications, legal, HR, sales, like all the other all the other fun stuff. Um, but we have a really great partnership. She lives in Boston. I live in Santa Barbara. So we also are a bi-coastal team now, having previously worked together in Boston. Um, so there's a lot of good stuff there. I don't know. I wouldn't have probably... Uh, kept at it if not for her i think it can be very lonely if you're a solo founder um to you know entrepreneurship is a roller coaster you have really high moments you have really low moments it can easy to get off it can be easy to get off track uh mariah and i definitely keep each other positive and tend to you know if i'm up she's down and vice versa and we get we get each other back to back to where we need to be to push the company forward then yeah, you've kind of answered my next question which was what does your day-to-day -day look like until then? It's kind of all over the place. Today is a weird day. So right after this, I'm going to do a pop-up at a, a local, um, it's like an outdoor furniture store called The Well in Summerland, California, which is near Montecito. Um, so I'll be slinging cocktails all day and chatting with people and selling, selling bottles, which I love. That's one of my favorite parts of the job is coming from a tech background where your customers are bots online. Um, it's quite exciting to hand people your your cocktail that you've worked so hard on and see joy and delight. Um, so that's what I'm doing today, which is, like I said, a weird day. Yesterday, I was a lot on sales. So I was, you know, doing a lot of calls, chatting with people online, setting up samplings. Uh, the day before, I was working on hiring. We were trying to hire some sales reps in a few different markets. Um, and so, yeah, every day is quite different. Mariah's job is quite different from mine. So she's often working with um, uh, our co-packer working, you know, to source great ingredients, um, working on the finance marketing side of things, getting social really robust. Uh, we overlap on social a lot. So as much as it can be hard to live on Instagram, we got to do it. So we spend a lot of time on Instagram, editing things, um, photo shoots. It's really everything. All the, all the stuff. I think you're muted, Duncan. Thank you. <laughs> I think that's a great question. <laughs> uh, 
I was going to say, sometimes I know from personal experience, like entrepreneurship can feel like a grind. And I have to, a lot of times, reframe and say, you know what? You could be doing nothing or you could be working for the wrong people. And I've done both of those things. And uh, so you, oftentimes I feel like you got to reframe. Uh, what are some of the challenges? I know you, since we're so socially focused, I wanted to ask about social because social can also feel like a grind. You know, what are some of the challenges or wins uh, that you feel like you guys have had with with your own social journey? Social can be hard. Uh, the first summer we were starting on Tilden, I was owning social. So it was, you know, I'd log into my personal Instagram and do the doom scroll. And then I'd log into the business Instagram and do the doom scroll. Like you have to just be very disciplined about how much time you're spending on it and what your goal is. Cause you can just get in the rabbit hole of checking out every competitor and you know, it's not always helpful. Um, so, you know, downside of social is it's kind of the same as the personal side of social. You can get really caught up in comparison. You can feel really down seeing, you know, this company got some great partnership and I'm so far behind. And, you know, it's all, um, as we've all learned about, you know, the personal side of social, it's all a facade. Often LinkedIn is the same, you know, I, I, we all do it. I do it too. Yay. We won this award. We did this. They don't see the 50 other things that went bad that day. Right. So I just have to constantly remind myself, like it's a highlight reel. It is what it is. Um, I think it could also be really tempting as an entrepreneur to sell, sell, sell and try to chase the quick wins. We are so obsessed with building authentic community that we've had to kind of shift our strategy away from buy this right now, buy this, like, please, you know, buy to hey, we want to have a discussion around what it means to go and entertain and be sober. Or, hey, you're hosting a dinner party this summer. Like, what options are you providing for your for your friends and family? Um, it's a slower burn. It would be really easy if we just turned on ads tomorrow and started trying to just, you know, increase follower count and all that sort of stuff. But we've been very, very disciplined with just slow growth, get the right people in, the right having the right people in will buy we have a very high email uh open rate because of that you know people who sign up for our email list are really excited about what we're doing and they're not just coming to us for a discount or coming to us for that like quick thing um but yeah the day-to-day of social can be difficult i think it's really like capping yourself like hey i'm gonna spend an hour and my goal on this on this little foray onto my instagram is to do x y and z um thinking creatively about like what types of content we we um generate you know it's constantly evolving and then i think just staying disciplined about your strategy and for us it's slow growth organic community building authenticity around the brand um yeah we've we fill you on that one don't we are now <laughs> Absolutely. And something you said, you know, pressing authenticity, something that I want to uh, mention that I absolutely loved when I was on your site was your uh, like journal entries. And they're so incredibly authentic. I just felt warm and fuzzy while reading them. And, <laughs> and I think, um, you know, your approach with what you're doing on social, uh, I just think that that's really exciting. I'm really happy for you guys. Um, I know you guys are going to see a lot of growth. Yeah. Um, I wanted to ask, how do you take care of yourself as a busy entrepreneur? You're obviously doing lots of things. Your hands are in lots of buckets. How do you take care of Vanessa? I am not the best at this, as probably every entrepreneur will tell you. I don't know. Like, there's good days, there's bad days. There's weeks where I'm really good about working out and I'm really healthy. And then there's weeks where you're just like, I have so many meetings, I'm just going to heat something up and it's not going to be good for me. And I, haven't seen the gym in who knows how long. Um, I've started chatting with a lot of other founders, which has been very helpful. So I'm now part of um, an organization called Female Startup Collective. They have a great podcast as well. Um, and we have, you know, weekly coffee chats. And it's so helpful because it just pulls that curtain back. Like I was saying, you know, Instagram being a highlight reel. These are all women who are on the surface running very 
successful, great CPG companies. And then you chat with them and they're like, I had the worst day yesterday. And you just wouldn't know that, you know, looking at their reel. Um, and it's just so helpful to have a community that we can vent, we can swap ideas. Um, with this new Zoom world, it opens up so many opportunities, but it can also feel very isolating as you're sitting, you know, in your house, like not speaking with anyone all day. Um, so that has been really helpful for just uh, allowing me to be more objective around like what I'm doing and more honest with myself about my goals and what I need to hit. I think on the other side, I've started meditating, which has been really good. Um, when I first quit drinking, I felt like that was already such a big hurdle that I was like, I don't need to also start meditating and start doing this and eating like super clean all the time. It felt like I gave up one vice. I get I get all the others. <laughs> <laughs> now that I've been three years sober, I'm like, OK, girl, it's time. Me, yes. it's like, start running again. You need to get on your swim thing, like maybe download Headspace. Like now I'm OK. It's sobriety's not your only thing. It's time to time to take care of the other things. Um, I started going to therapy again. I've talked. You mentioned my blog. I've blogged about, you know, why I gave up drinking, um, what it was like getting married without alcohol, like all these different topics that I think about a lot. Um, and therapy has been kind of a mainstay in my life for the last 12 years, I would say, since college. Um, and it's just very helpful. And the the type of therapy changes. Now I you know, complain. I talk a lot with my therapist around work-life balance and what it means to be a founder. And she reminds me, you know, you're kind of mentioning this, Duncan, like the ups and downs of entrepreneurship. The grass is always greener. When I worked at my previous tech company, which I absolutely loved, I was just in my head constantly, oh, I, I would love to work for myself. I want to be doing PR for myself. I want to do this. And now that I'm doing PR for myself, I'm like, I would kill to have someone telling me what to do every day and giving <laughs> that to-do list. And then I check it off and I go to dinner and I don't think about it till 9 a.m. tomorrow you know, you always want what you can't have. And so I think my therapy journey now is very much just um, getting objective perspective on like where I am, what I'm doing, how great it is that I'm doing this. There are obviously low moments, but on the whole, um, you know, I have free time. I can, I mean, free time. I have, I can make my schedule, right? If I want to peace out at noon and go to therapy, I can do that if I want to take the day off because I need to go drive down to LA and like go do some brand meetings. Like I can do that. It's there are a lot of pluses to being an entrepreneur. And I think just being really rigid about building those moments of reflection and pause and health and working out and all that stuff into it is um, key for me. You know, it's so uh, I love I love uh, I love your thoughts on that. And I think um for us on 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 our side, I think being connected as entrepreneurs and uh, even as um being involved with entrepreneurship, being connected is so important because I mean, you could go, you know, let's say you know you have something you wanted to solve. You could go to Accenture, right? And they will charge you hundred thousand dollars to get to know the space, and then they'll spend another forty five thousand on crafting a solution. Then you see the solution that say, "Fuck, this has got nothing to do with what I need." And you could go to your founder's circle, and you'll get that answer in a few minutes, right? And so you don't have to a go to people that don't get you. So the connection piece, I feel like, is so important. And um, I've all, I've also found that looking back. And where I was, you know, three months ago or six months ago or a year ago is so useful and saying like, hey, you're, I've made so much progress in this, but um, it is a, it, it is a, it is a journey for sure. And one of the things that Ar Arnal and I like to do uh, on, on every one of these podcasts, um, you know, believe it or not, most of them are either carefully researched or like referrals that we really trust. And so, um, we look into who the people are and you know you all are a very special breed and as leaders we just don't get thanked enough and so we're going to take this moment right now both of us are going to say thank you uh to you and mariah for doing this because you're making so many people's lives better so you know hopefully you will tell mariah that i was on this random podcast and they just stopped to thank us for doing what we do so like a heartfelt thanks from both of us
We appreciate it. We built this brand for ourselves and have been so excited that so many people are resonating with it. And um, yeah, we just want to get it out to more people. It, I wanted to ask one other question about uh, specifically about um, design. I was uh, reading an article about your design, your, your, your label yeah. design. And yeah. uh, it says here that the elegant signature Tilden's logo is formed with minimal strokes, creating a long arm T at the top of a circle. And even the typography choices reinforce the brand's elegant and booze repositioning. The cocktail bottles, a stout, thick glass vessel with narrow neck. So it's interesting how much thought has gone into all of that. Um, yeah. And, um, you know, that is just all, when we get the bottles in our hand, we're going to geek out about it. But um, a on a related note, and this is just an op open-ended question, no wrong answer. Do you find that music is a part of the ethos of the brand? Music. Um, yeah, we very much built the brand around hosting and social gathering. And obviously music and ambiance is a huge piece of that. So um, we had a lot of inspirations as we were designing the brand. You mentioned our logo and our label. We worked with a great branding agency called Utendal Creative. And, you know, there were a lot of mood boards and a lot of back and forth feedback. And um, we wanted bottles that fit into the types into the types of occasions we were attending. So whether that was a tablescape at a dinner party or a wood paneled cocktail bar in Brooklyn. Like we wanted our bottle to sit on a shelf and match that occasion. Um, there are so many fun, colorful new brands out there in the grocery aisle um, uh, at barbecues. And we felt like that was really covered. We didn't need to reinvent the wheel. We wanted to really lean into tradition and elegance and um, jazzy music moments and, you know, great, like, by soundscapes um and that really enforced sort of a lot of the branding we designed i'll hold up the bottle just so people can get an idea so that's our logo um which that is like the tea that you were describing tilden's obviously the name this is our lace wing which is cucumber basil we designed the bottle also so that people can reuse it as like a, a vase or a candle holder and then it could drip onto the flat top. So we were just very intentional about wanting to create something that could be reused um, and again could fit into 99% of all occasions. Yeah. So if somebody is interested in um, your brand, how can they buy you? How can they find you guys? Yeah. So we sell online at drinktilden.com. Um, it's T I L D E N. Uh, it's named after Tilden Park in Berkeley, California, if people are aware of that um, beautiful nature reserve. Um, we are also available at a nearly 50 uh, bars, restaurants, and bottle shops around the country. So on our website, uh, at the very top, it says Find Us, and you can click. You can put it in your zip code and see um, if there's a, a spot near you. You can also request um, that places carry us. So we are always taking feedback on local bars, restaurants we should reach out to. Um, and we're eager to hear more tips from people. Um, and then you can also follow us on Instagram and we're just at Drink Tilden. And we we post a lot of behind the scenes stuff, um, blog posts from, from me and Mariah. Um, and we share a lot of news on there. So this has been exceptional. It has been. Thank you for uh, joining us and heading out so big thank you everyone for tuning into this episode this episode is brought to you by fire valley marketing and fire valley we can help mission-based food and beverage brands bring people closer through social media marketing so if you're ready to use social media to create more community and excitement around your food and beverage brand go to firevalleymarketing.com to learn more thank you so much vanessa this has been a blast um you look yeah. forward we look forward to talking to you more in the future. And everyone, this has been another episode of the Fire Belly Social Show with Duncan and Arnell, where we feature amazing people that are leading mission-driven food and beverage brands and doing awesome things and dig into their journeys. So thank you for listening and we'll see you on the next one. 
for listening to the Firebelly Social Show. We'll see you again next time, and be sure to click subscribe to get future episodes.